Good to see everyone here this morning. It's good to be seen here this morning. Uh, I've mentioned to more than one person that uh, I thought the elders asked me to come here to preach just so that I would come back home, <laughs> being the prodigal son. I had planned to come back a couple years ago, but events uh, took place that I could not afford to. It is wonderful to be back home. It is wonderful to see so many faces that, uh, that I remember, and it's good to see some, some new folks as well. That's wonderful. And to be able to sit out there, I see everyone sitting there and listening, except for eventually Henry Bourne will probably fall asleep as he used to in Bible class. Hi, Henry. It's good to see you again, brother. It's good to see my uh, sister and brother-in-law and come down from Georgia. We had a nice meal uh, yesterday. I remember uh, my brother-in-law asked me, okay, for, for Bible class, will it be just a sermon or will, you know, also a Bible class? And I said, yes. <laughs> that people can ask questions. It's going to be more of a sermon format, but people can ask questions and people can make comments except Brother Paul Brantley. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. <laughs> but Michael will understand this. If I find out that I'm getting too far behind and will not finish, I will be not accepting anything and we'll just move on. There's more I want to say, but it's good to be back. It's, it's good to see so many people, and I'm sure we'll catch up as, as the week continues. I am honored and definitely humbled to be invited back and to especially uh, preach a series of sermons that's been on my mind and I'm sure yours for a number of years and that is dealing with the ungodliness that we are seeing in this country the thing of it is it's not just this country it's the world wherever you look on the map there are things like are taking place in the United States that are taking place there as well. But we're going to notice a few things in this morning about the effects of it that it has on people, that it has on nations, countries, and the world in general. I'd like to just quickly begin by mentioning a few things of what I noticed when I moved back to Colorado. And I moved to uh, the Denver area back in 1983 lived there for about 18 years before I uh, left to attend the Memphis School of Preaching. And then uh, preached in uh, Cheyenne and then in here and worked with Bellevue for, uh, for a while. When I moved back, I had been gone for 14 years. A lot of changes had been taken place and most of those changes were not good. A lot of it dealt with the ungodliness of the governors of Colorado over the years and of course the mayors of those cities. When I was living here, they decided that they would legalize marijuana. You remember talking about that, and some people were making jokes about the old song, John Denver, Mount Rocky Mountain High. One of the consequences, and the greatest consequence of this, in talking with the folks who were born and raised in that state, who've lived there all their lives, said when that took place, you had basically riffraff from all over the country moved to Colorado. Denver's always had a lot of work. I mean, you could move there in one week and find a job, if not less. But now, these people who've moved in, they don't want to work. I think you see some of that here. You see some of that throughout the country. People just don't want to work. What they wanted to do, though, is to come out here and, and get high on weed. It was legal. And then panhandle. Because of this, you have also seen an, an increase in crime. It's led to that. Uh, increase in crime. Uh, drug addiction and other forms, alcoholism. Heroin addiction has gone up. There are certain parks in downtown Denver that you don't even want to go through because there are spent needles all over the place. 
So what does the state of Colorado do? They decide to hand out clean needles so people can continue to do drugs. That was their answer to it. And the homeless problem has exploded, and Denver's always had a homeless problem, but uh, these folks really aren't homeless. They're bums. They're addicts. They want to live this way. And they live in their huts, and you've seen uh, pictures in L.A., you've seen pictures in uh, other places in California, and it spread throughout downtown, and now it's spreading throughout the suburbs. And not just in Denver, it's down in the Springs. You see it in other towns like in Salida. This gentleman here knows these towns that I'm talking about. So it has spread through a lot of the uh, smaller towns in Colorado as well. Their answer to it is, is nothing, to do absolutely nothing about it. I do believe that the country that I grew up in, and this is my opinion, you can either accept it or be wrong, it's up to you. But I believe the country that I grew up in is dead. It's gone. And I don't know that it'll ever be coming back. I, I really have my doubts. I hope that it will. But if it does, it's going to have to return to God for that to take place. When you remove God from a society in all of its forms, from the classroom, from the government, from pretty much every walk of life, there's going to be a huge void. And that void has been filled with ungodliness ungodly leaders, and when you have a country that has ungodly leaders, you will have a country that will become ungodly. Look at the uh, nation of the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, what took place because of their ungodly leaders. And how ungodly this country and the world will get, I do not know. What kind of persecution will the Lord's church face becoming even more grievous? I'm not sure. I know this, we should not really be surprised if it does take place. Uh, one of the sermons that I preached before leaving uh, Denver, Brother Kent came up to me and says, you know, there could be a time when a sermon like that will get you arrested. If we lived in Canada, it would have. One of the things uh, that we know is what the Bible teaches, biblical history about what a nation, what happens to a nation when they turn from God. And there's a number of verses that come to our mind. Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge is another passage. I like the one in Psalms 107, verse 34, where the psalmist is writing about a fruitful land that was turned into barrenness. And the reason that it was turned into barrenness was for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. God can punish a nation in a number of ways. And it could be we're starting to see that now. I'd like for us to turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, we're going to begin in verse 9. Now at the beginning of this chapter, Peter is writing about false prophets, false teachers at that time, but it could be at any time for that matter. And he's wanting us to know, and he was wanting the people at that time to know, that God will punish them. They're not going to get away with this. And he gives three examples proven that they're not going to get away with this. And first is the angels. In verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment. We'll stop right there. That's the first example. These higher beings, higher than man, these angels, they left their first habitat. You can read this in Jude 6 as well. Jude also kind of parallels Second Peter here. But if God didn't spare them, but delivered them to hell, this is actually Tartarus. To be reserved 
unto that day of judgment, by the way, they're still there. They're still in change. They're still being reserved unto judgment. The ones who sinned or rebelled against God, what will he do to these false prophets? What will he do to false prophets, but what will he also do to those who are rebellious, who are ungodly in any form of sin? Another example, the next one is found in verse 5, and this is Noah. The next example, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And once again, here you notice that God has a way of punishing the wicked, but preserving, in other words, be rescuing those who are faithful, those who are godly. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, we begin reading about the destruction of this first world, let's put it that way, with the flood. And there's a comment that has always struck me, because it almost seems like this is the day and age that we're living in, and I said that about 10 years ago, and it's not gotten any better. So if it's not as wicked as Noah's day, we sure are running as fast as we can to get there. I don't believe that we're as bad off as uh, the world in Noah's day, but I think it's getting close. And it talks about how the wickedness of man was great, that every intent or imagination of the thoughts of their heart was what? Only evil, continually. Now, I don't know what it's like here in Pensacola anymore, but I know what it's like out in Denver. That seems to be the way people live their lives. They're thinking only about what kind of sin can I commit today, and for them it's not sin at all. It's just that the way that they're accustomed to living. And sadly, uh, the history of man on this planet is not good. Matthew 7, 13, and 14, you remember that most people are going to enter in through that wide gate that leadeth to destruction. Now, these are the words of Jesus himself. A few are going to ent enter into that straight or that narrow gate which leads to life. And so when the Lord says that most people are going to be lost, that should give us pause. Now, I know there's a lot of people, a lot of people, liberals in the church, who say, well, God is love, and he's not going to punish anybody. Show me that book, chapter, and verse. It's not there. God is love. God is love because he showed it when he gave his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins. But we will be judged one day and how we've lived this life. But God knows how to punish the wicked. He knows how also to preserve the righteous, the faithful. Noah is called a preacher of righteousness in this text. And understanding that all of God's commandments are righteous, Psalm 119, 172, he was faithful to God, carrying out his commands, following what God wanted him to do. But being a preacher of righteousness also tells us that he cared about those who were lost at that period of time. He didn't want to see anyone lost before that flood struck and destroyed the world and the inhabitants. He cared about them. Begs the question, shouldn't we? We do live in an ungodly world. We're around people who are ungodly all the time whether you're still working for a living, whether you're going to the grocery store, the gas station, you're around people who are living ungodly lives. Do we really care about their soul? To speak to them. And people we come in contact with who are wicked, does that make us shy away from trying to talk to them about salvation? It didn't know. I do believe his day was worse than ours. 
I don't have to like someone who's living a wicked lifestyle. Even though I may not like them personally, I still agape, love them, which means I'm going to look past who they are or how they live to try to save their soul by speaking to them about the Christ. Remember, that's why he came to this earth. He didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, Luke 5, 32. And yet the leaders in Jesus' day, you think about the scribes and the Pharisees, condemned him for doing that. For being around publicans and sinners. Well, that's who he came to save. The sinners. We can also have, if we're not careful, we can have the attitude of those public and sinners. If we look upon someone who's living an ungodly life, a wicked life, maybe worse than other people do, and we decide to just, as the saying goes, write them off. They're not worthy to be saved. I don't care if they burn in hell for all eternity. Well, that was the attitude of the Jews. Whether it was the Samaritans or the Gentiles. Could have cared less. We shouldn't have that attitude. Noah cared for the people at that period of time. He didn't want them to be lost. When I think of uh, the attitude of I hear this phrase coming up more and more. Mainstream churches of Christ. Most of them would think that Noah was a dismal failure. Saving souls. But most of the people at that period of time would also think that, well, people at this period of time would think Jesus was a dismal failure. Because the most of the people that he taught, if you remember, they didn't obey. Even though they saw him work and perform those miracles, they refused to obey. And most people today still refuse to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Too many today have the attitude, and this has been going on too long, that when you see a large congregation, Church of Christ, wow. They must be doing something right. In most cases, when I see a very large congregation, the Church of Christ, I'm thinking the opposite. What are they involved in now? That's not in according to God's holy word. That's not according to the pattern. Uh, but whether it's large and small, folks, a lot of times you don't know. You learn a lot from websites whether a congregation is faithful or not. And sometimes you just have to show up, you go, and then walk away disappointed, shaking your head. You remember the day back in the 50s and the 60s? I don't remember the 50s so well. You can talk to my brother-in-law about that. But it was wherever you went, you heard the same thing. You heard the gospel of Christ. That people worshipped in spirit and in truth. Now you don't know what you're going to get. I mentioned this in a lecture uh, a number of years ago. You know, that's old Forrest Gump saying, you don't know what you're going to get. Life is like a box of chocolates. And a lot of churches of Christ this day, it's going to be full of nuts. Sorry about that. Their last name is Nut. My sister married a knot. <laughs> you think about Noah's preaching. He saved himself. But he also saved his wife. He saved his three sons and their wives. You know what that means? He saved his family. What husband, what father today would not like that kind of credit to their name. But another example, and this is the last one, of God going to be punishing those who preach false doctrines and who live ungodly in, in any lifestyle, is the account of Lot. 
Beginning in verse 6, 2 Peter chapter 2. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Now you turn over to the book of Jude. This account is found there as well. In verse 7, we read, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Almost forgot to ask. Any questions? Any comments? Any disagreements? Now is your opportunity. And like I used to say, teaching a Bible class on Wednesday night, if you have any disagreements, you'll have to talk to the preacher right there. But please, anyone, anything that you've seen in your life, and things like that going on as far as the ungodliness and the effects that it has. Even Brother Paul Brantley could say something. Wow. Have you ever seen it this quiet, Michael? No. No, uh, the violence, the anger, the attitude that people have that they have a right to do those things. It is. Uh, I've, I've run into that uh, at work. At a number of places I've worked, people have uh, the same attitude. They don't want to hear it anymore. I've heard that in the Lord's Church. The congregation out in Denver, when I, back in 96, where Brother Camp was starting to preach at the East Alameda Church of Christ, one lady said, I've heard that all my life. I want to hear something different. And uh, when I started to attend there, my dad was there for a while, and he mentioned, this congregation has not heard this kind of preaching. I gave him two years. <laughs> and that was about two years, and they got rid of him. But they weren't used to hearing the whole gospel of Christ. They were used to hearing something simple. They wanted their ears tickled. But uh, where I work... I work for one of the government uh, contractors in, in Aurora. Uh, we have like six different agencies. One of those is probation, people coming up to probation all the time. And probation officers don't do much of anything anymore. Now, parole, that's another story. But people come in on probation high on drugs, uh, drunk. They'll get high just before coming up. We had one individual we thought, we don't know if that fellow is even going to find the elevator. He was so high. But, uh, and they're not going to do anything about it. But you see women coming in, more and more women coming in, with babies. One came in last week, and I'm thinking to myself, that child deserves a better mother than that. 
and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But yes, it is. It's uh, definitely affected the children. In every generation, they seem to be drifting further and further away. Getting back to a lot and, and thinking about what Jude had to say. Given themselves over to fornication, Strong's defines this as to be utterly unchaste. Utterly, completely unchaste. Gone after strange flesh. Strange means other or different. This was basically men with men, not with women. Barnes refers to it as go, uh, going after as being greatly addicted to this vice, and that was the vice of sodomy, homosexuality. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown defines it as departing from the course of nature and going after that which is unnatural. And that's what they were doing, and that's why they got punished. Romans 1, 26, 27 is another passage that we could look at. The governor of Colorado, Governor Polish, is an ungodly homosexual. He lives with his partner there in the mansion. And a lot of the uh, people in Denver, they're as like with Corinth, they were puffed up about it. Look how great we are. We put up with this, even though deeply they will disagree with it. They're almost proud of it, that he is. And then you think about the, well, what is it now? LGBTQXRZ, who knows where it's going to end? That crowd. They don't want to just say that they're a different lifestyle. They want to destroy everyone and everything that disagrees with that lifestyle. I'll give you an example of that in Denver. Lakewood. Lakewood is uh, west of Denver. It's right up against the mountains. Uh, there is a baker there, a man who has his own shop that makes cakes. Some of you probably have already know about this individual. Wedding cakes. Homosexuals have come in to his shop more than once, and they could buy cakes anywhere. But they know that he is against this sin. He does have some morals about him. He believes that homosexuality is a sin, so he refuses to bake cakes for them. So they sue him. Reason? They want to destroy him completely, utterly. This is how evil, this is how hateful this group actually is. And there's a lot of that going on. Uh, the Supreme Court of Colorado, of course, went with them, but it went to the Supreme Court of the country and they were denounced. But now you've got transsexuals even coming into his shop. It's not going to end. We have uh, an adversary who's walketh about always seeking who he may devour? Always. Well, these are his minions. But a different lifestyle, that's, that's what they refer to themselves. I'm just living a different lifestyle. What does God say about the men of Sodom and Gomorrah? He said, they were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Not just a little bit, Genesis 13, 13, exceedingly. Their sin was very grievous, Genesis 18, 20. They were made an ensample to those who would follow after who should live that wicked lifestyle. Those who will not inherit eternal life. But once again, we notice Lot, with Lot, God is able to deliver the righteous, but also punish those who are wicked. Lot's referred to as a just, a righteous man, which means it's possible to live a godly life in an ungodly world. Have we ever heard that saying, well, you know, they would have been better, but it was the product, they're just the product of their environment. Lot well, wasn't. He kept himself separate from the world, from that lifestyle. He came out from among them, and be ye separate, 2 Corinthians 6, 16. Lot was vexed with the filthy conversation, the lifestyle that was all around him at that time. Vexed is an interesting word. 
Vex means to wear down. It means to harass beyond endurance. Have we ever felt that way? Do you ever get just almost wore down by the wickedness that's all around us? The ungodliness that's all around us? Do you ever think to yourselves, why would anybody want to live forever here on this earth? There has to be something better, and there is, of course, if we remain faithful. But day in and day out, they kept, as verse 8 states, tormenting his righteous soul. Every day, and you think about what he saw, what he heard while he was living there. Their unlawful deeds. And the standard by what is lawful or not lawful is not the state of Colorado or the state of Florida or the Supreme Court or the President. It's God. It's his holy word. That's the standard. And everybody today is amenable to the gospel of Christ, whether they believe it or not, whether they've had their fill of it or not, they're still going to be judged. Every single one of us will stand before the Lord on the day of judgment one day and give account of how we've lived our lives, whether good or bad, 2 Corinthians 5.10. There's no getting over that. H.D. Hardiman used to use the word ungetterovable. You can't get over it. You can't get under it. You can get around it. That's going to be a fact. That's going to happen. The Apostle Paul wrote, And even as they refused to God, have God in their knowledge, God gave them up into a reprobate mind to do those things which are not fitting. That's Romans 128, American Standard Version. When Christ came in the world, John 1, 5, we read, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended or apprehended it not. Should we really be surprised that these things are happening in our day? Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun. Same thing's happening. There's a comment that Guy and Woods made about Lot. I think, uh, I think it's very important for us, especially today. Writing about Lot, he said, though in the midst of extreme wickedness, number one, Lot was not corrupted by it. Secondly, Brother Woods wrote, he did not become indifferent to it. That's huge. And third, he was daily concerned about the wicked lifestyles of the people around him. He didn't want them to be lost either. If we're not concerned about the ungodliness of this country, if it doesn't give us righteous anger over it, maybe we've been corrupted. Maybe we have become indifferent to what's taking place. And maybe there's something wrong with us. We should be concerned. The ungodliness that permeates every aspect of life. We must not be indifferent or we will be corrupted. You think of the music, what's on television, movies. I'll give you an example as far as maybe becoming indifferent. The Super Bowl commercials. You think of the Budweiser commercials that are so cute. Do we smile when we see them? Drinking is still a sin in God's eyes. You know how many people lose their lives because of alcoholism? Their homes, their families, when you think about whether it's marijuana, uh, heroin, meth, whatever it is, you know what the, the most evil drug there is? It's alcohol. But still, because it's so prevalent, it's so easy to get. And it will hook you. Do we smile when we see commercials like that? That are ungodly? That are sinful? 
I was thinking about this the other day. What was X-rated back in the 70s is on TV today. Not just that the movie's rated PG, I mean it's on television. I don't mean just HBO. I mean on regular television. Does that bother us? See some of the commercials. Make my mother blush. See some of those commercials today. Do we? Remember what Jeremiah said about Judah? Jeremiah 6, 15. I think this is our day. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. They had become indifferent to the sin around them. They had become corrupted by the sin around them as well. What happened? What will happen to any nation? That continues on in this way. We know what happened to uh, Judah. You continue to read in that passage. Therefore, here's the summation of that attitude. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Will this nation be cast down? I sometimes wonder why God hasn't punished the United States of America yet, and maybe he is in certain ways, in certain areas. But I mean really lowered the boom, as the saying goes. And maybe that's because there's still enough salt of the earth, the lights out there, faithful Christians, we're still standing for the truth. Verse 9 of our text, 2 Peter chapter 2, all these passages that we've read leads up to verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. We're about ready to come to a close. So if you have any more questions or comments, this is your last chance. Paul said something about the Jews in his day about that. They went to establish their own righteousness following, instead of following the righteousness of God. One of the things that we notice, though, in this text, no matter what time man lives, God will punish the wicked. God will also preserve he will rescue those who are righteous, those who are living godly lives. He has the power to do that. That doesn't mean that we will not face any persecution. We know that all Christians will. You're living that godly life. And even be grateful for it. But this is a promise that he has made. And he always keeps his promises. And it can, the world that we're live in, living in, may just seem to vex our righteous souls. If we have a righteous soul. It may wear us down to where that we're just about ready to give up. And then you think about 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, 
but will with them temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. And God has never asked us to do something that we cannot do. That means we don't have to give in. We don't have to be indifferent to the world. We do not have to be corrupted by the world. And we can live a godly life in an ungodly world. And we better. We need to be that light of this earth. The salt of this world. We need to set the right example. I work around people who are just about as ungodly as it gets. Even women. The vulgar talk. You know the old saying about uh, swearing like a sailor. A drunken sailor. I, I know some people that would make drunken sailors blush. One of the things I pray going to work in the morning that I'll be humble, that I'll be kind, that I'll set the right example, that if I become angry that I don't sin. The thing of it is, we all need to think this way. Definitely not because I do. But that should be a godly attitude that we have. There's the old saying that we may be the only Bible some people read. In the time that we're living, that is absolutely true. Noah was not a product of his surroundings. Lot was not a product of his surroundings. And the list could go on and on and on. All those things are excuses. I think it was Brother Rice said that an excuse is nothing but a lie. And it is. It just looks prettier than the, a real reason behind it. What about us? Are we concerned about what we see around us? Or have we become indifferent? Or worse, have we become corrupted by it? Appreciate your attendance, uh, attendance your attention. Thankful that Henry Bourne didn't fall asleep.